Okay, what's up guys? Uh, today we're going to do Flavius Philostratus, and that's uh, F-L-A-V-I-U-S P-H-I-L-O-S-T-R-A-T-U-S, Flavius Philostratus. And uh, he was the biographer of Apollonius of Tiana. Um, and here's his spirit testimony. I salute you, sir. I wrote the life and adventures of Apollonius of Tiana by the order of Julia Domina, and no reasonable person would suppose for an instant that she would have desired an adept in oriental languages to have transcribed them for her, if the character to whom they related had not been of great note. Whoever denies the statements of critics that Apollonius of Tiana was a great man in his day and generation denies the truth. Among the first and most remarkable discoveries of the Empress Julia was the identity or striking resemblance of the sculpted features of the faces of the Roman deity Apollo and Apollonius of Tiana, as they were then represented at Rome. I took the facts of my history of Apollonius from the memoirs of Damis, parentheses, the St. John or beloved disciple of the great man, and parentheses, from his birth to the beginning of the second century, and from the Moragenes, that's M-O-E-R-A-G-E-N-E-S, to the time of the Eusthenes, E U. A S T H E N E S. All these men were biographers of Apollonius before my time, and from their works I wrote my history of him. But every effort has been made by succeeding popes and emperors since the reign of Constantine the Great to destroy what I wrote about Apollonius. But it is a fact that he, Apollonius, was, by the Romans, worshipped in the days of Septimus, Servius, as the great Prometheus, or savior of men. And this continued up to the time when I wrote his history. The feasts in honor of him were always celebrated in connection with a certain star, such as the star of Bethlehem. And this star was in the constellation Aries, or the Lamb. He was worshipped as the center of God's eternal cycle, or eternal circle, under the idea of propitiatory sacrifice. Mankind had sacrificed every animal, from a frog to a horse, and finally ended with human blood offerings. And this was deemed a necessity in my age to purify a soul. This was concurrent with the purification related by the Eusenes, and that's E-U-X-E-N-E-S. From his days to my time, there was just as much of sacrifice observed as in previous times. The purest virgin of Rome had to die in honor of the god Apollo, and her soul passed to Apollonius in paradise. Now I will say in conclusion, I saw hundreds of persons kissing the Greek cross and offering up the last dying prayer of the Promethean Savior, accompanied with the burning of myrrh and frankincense, incense, the same as you see this done in the Christian churches at your approaching Easter festival. The Catholic spirits are so shut up in their earthly acquired dependence upon their priests that they cannot ascend as spirits out of that condition and they are forced back to earth. No ascent is possible for them. While thus held, and they retract upon you mortals with disastrous force, there was no such religion as the Christian religion in my day. There was a sect who worshipped the Hindu Christos. Their religion was a mixture of Buddhism, Plat Platonism, and greco gymniosophism and their first and most important rite was circumcision. But they were not very numerous or widespread. They resided mainly at Ephesus, Cairo, and Rome. 
The chief symbol of the religion was a circle within which were represented the human sexual organs. They were very secret in their movements, and their teachings were very obscure. No one knew of such a person as Jesus of Nazareth at that time. The Nazarites were held in the greatest contempt by the Jews, and it was for that reason the Christian priesthood chose that obscure village of Judea for the scene of Jesus' abode. I am Flavius Philostrophus. Okay, there's uh, Flavius' spirit testimony, and I want you to refer to Smith's Dictionary of Greek and Roman Biography. Um, it is not a little singular that this most invaluable work of Philostratus has never been wholly translated into English. It is very evident that the scholars of English-speaking peoples have too much regard for their popularity to venture to give their patrons an English translation of this Christianity, annihilating narrative of the life, adventures, and teachings of the real author and founder of the ecclesiastical fraud. It is impossible for one of space to give all the extracts which seem important to get a true idea of the value of this communication. To those of our readers who wish to pursue the investigation of the subject of this sketch in connection with Apollonius, we would say that if they will refer to the account of Apollonius by Benjamin Jowett, Benjamin Jowett, J-O-W-E-T-T, -T, fellows and tutor of Balloyal College, Oxford, England, as published in Smith's Dictionary of Greek and Roman Biography, they will find they will find there they will there find in connection with the life of Apollonius a brief discussion of three very important questions, namely one, the historical groundwork on which the narrative of Philostratus was founded, two, how far, if at all, it was designed as a rival to gospel history, three, the real character of Apollonius himself. These discussions will show how Christian critics flounder fruitlessly about to reconcile undoubted historical facts with the fraudulent pretenses of the, quote, gospel history, as they are pl pleased to designate their string of theological fables. It is a fact that must end all possible controversy as to whether Philostratus borrowed any part of the general story of our Lord's life, or whether the latter was not boldly bodily stolen from the life and writings of Apollonius of Tiana, that Philostratus does not mention Jesus Christ or his twelve apostles, or either of the so-called Christian Gospels, as having furnished him in any of the materials for his biography. But the main source of his information was the memoirs of Damis and Maximus of E.G.A.E., of the life, doings, and teachings of Apollonius, the beloved master, written while yet Apollonius was living. It is certain that when Philostratus wrote his biography, Jesus of Nazareth had never been heard of, that there is, therefore, any striking analogy between the life of Apollonius and the life attributed to the Christian Jesus is sufficient to show that the latter is but a bungling parody on or a plagiarism of Philostratus' life of Apollonius. Of this fact, we now in hand, now in hand, ample spirit and historical testimony to fully establish. We also call attention to the third chapter of Charles Blount's English translation of Philostratus' Greek text. We will be found the sources from which Philostratus drew his materials for the biography of Apollonius. Um, according to Charles Blount, it appears that while in his work, Philostratus speaks disparagingly of Moragenes, 
M-O-E-R-A-G-E-N-E-S, as a reliable authority. He mentions him in his communication as his authority for the facts appertaining to some portions of his work. On the other hand, he mentions Maximus of A-E-G-A-E as one of his authorities in his work, while in the communication he does not mention him, but mentions E-U-A-S-T-H-E-N-E-S, why he does not mention the testament written by Apollonius himself. In the communication, we do not know unless he made but little use of it in it, <clears throat> it in composing his biography. All the facts would seem to in indicate that Damis did not commence his memoirs or commentaries on the life and labors of Apollonius until after he met the latter at Nineveh, N-I-N-E-V-E-H, when he was on his way to India. At that time. Apollonius was past 40 years of age. It seems that Maximus had made a record of the events of his life while at Aegae -E in the temple of Aesculapius, where, young as he then was, he gained the greatest renown as a healer and a philosopher. After leaving Aeg, there seems to have been no record kept of his doings until he determined to set out on the wanderings in the search, set out on the wanderings in the search, and in the dissemination of knowledge, which only ended with his great old age. Professor Jowett, J-O-W-E-T-T, -T, says there seems to have been a gap in his history of nearly 20 years, that that is true so far as historic records go, but not true so far as the spirit testimony of Apollonius is concerned. After his wanderings through the countries of Asia Minor, fulfilling his Pythagorean probation of long years of silence and contemplation, he went to Antioch and opened a school where he taught the modified Essenian philosophy which he had conceived and which it was to be his life's mission to give to the world. It was there he held fellowship with the great Essenian patriarch Ignatius of Antioch, that's I-G-N-A-T-I-U-S, of Antioch, and in time gained the highest name for learning and wisdom of all the philosophers of his time. Especially did he gain renown as a healer of all human maladies by virtue of his sympathetic and magnetic nature. At that period, there seems to have been a great outpouring of spirit power upon the people of southwestern Asia, and especially upon the people of Judea. Hearing of the wonderful doings of Apollonius at Antioch, the Jews became importunate, I-M-P-O-R-T-U-N-A-T-E, that he should appear among them, and at length prevailed upon him to visit Jerusalem, for which place he set out. Apollonius, in his spirit communication, recounts the incidents attending his entrance, entrance into Jerusalem, and the results substantially, as is related in the Gospels of the Christian concerning the Jesus of Nazareth. The jealousy of the Jewish priesthood was so aroused against him on account of the popular excitement occasioned by his wonderful work of healing among them, that he was compelled to seek safety by flight. Returning to Antioch, he resumed his teachings there and continued them until he decided to start for India. There is no doubt some good reason why that portion of Apollonius's life's work is not forthcoming at this time which will be disclosed in the future. It is by no means certain, but that the copy of Philostratatus's work that has been permitted to come down to us has been largely suppressed by the Christian pontiffs or their kingly tools. That gap covers the precise time when it is said Jesus of Nazareth was performing those miracles of spiritual power for performing which he has been worshipped as a god, or as god. In this connection, we are led to notice one passage in the gospel, according to Matthew, which shows 
that the hero of that gospel was not Galilean, and that's G-A-L-I-L-E-A-N, but quite another person. And Jesus went, and this is Matthew um, 4, 23 and 24, quote, uh, And Jesus went about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness, and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went th throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people, that were taken with divers diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those which had the palsy and he healed them. Now, so far as Syria is concerned, that was certainly the case with Apollonius, who at Antioch, the capital city of Syria, was over, overwhelmed with his labors as a mediumistic healer, that Apollonius who had for many years been performing his miraculous cures in the very heart of Syria, should have acquired fame in that extensive country was natural, but that Jesus of Nazareth, of whom no one heard until then, should have had such an extensive fame in so short a time was perfectly absurd. We venture to say that brief mission attributed to Jesus of Nazareth in after centuries as having been performed in Galilee and Judea, was nothing more nor less than a parody on the account of the journey made by Apollonius from Antioch to Jerusalem, and his stay among the priest-ridden and superstitious Jews. He would naturally have gone by way of Galilee, and no doubt preached and healed as he went, creating the very excitement among the Jews that he created wherever he went afterwards, from India and Egypt to the most polished cities of ancient Greece and Rome. Reader is not, uh, reader is not this a most natural and unavoidable inference. It is just this part of the grand and unprecedented career of Apollonius that has been blotted out. It is not most, is it not most significant that it is during the period of this journey of Apollonius to Jerusalem by way of Damascus and Galilee that only part of the life of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that amounted to anything is fixed. But more than all else is the testimony of the spirit of Philostratus, Philostratus, <laughs> important. When he tells us that in the third century at Rome, the especial and original seat of the Christian church, that Apollonius of Tiana was worshipped as the savior of men, and the very time he, Philostratus, wrote his biography, is this not a most significant fact? For fact it is, as Christian writers are forced to admit, had Jesus of Nazareth been so worshipped at the time, what sense or reason would there have been in the Emperor Servius, S-E-V-E-R-U-S, and his subjects to have worshipped Apollonius as a savior? But this is not all. The star dedicated to Apollonius was a star in the zodiac zodiacal constellation Aries, or Agnes, the Lamb, in which the sun crossed the equinoctial line at the vernal equinox, thus identifying Apollonius as the crucified lamb, whose crucifixion redeemed the world from the desolation and death of winter. The sacrifice of the purest virgin of Rome to Apollo, the sun god, and the suppo supposition that her soul passed to Apollonius in paradise, shows the veneration in which the memory of the latter was held, at least 150 years after his transition to spirit life. We know from dear bought experience that the spirit of Philostratus is correct when he says that the Roman Catholic and other Christian spirits are the curse of humanity on account of their spirituality, but voluntarily enslaved condition and their earthbound purgatorial despair. It is certainly true 
that there was no Christian religion at Rome until more than 50 years after Philostratus transitioned from Earth. The religion relating to the worship of the Hindu Christos was not openly taught, and the sect was without influence. Their symbol, the phallic cross, showed the Indian origin of their belief. No such person as Jesus of Nazareth was then known, and the great probability is that Apollonius was the Nazarite who went through Galilee to Jerusalem. He was undoubtedly an Essene, and the Essenes were called Nazarites by the Jews as a term of reproach. It is impossible for us to dwell more fully on this most valuable communication, but we have adduced more than amply enough to show its substantial correctness from beginning to end. And uh, that was Philostrophatus, Philostrophus, um, Flavius Philostrophus, and that's F L A V I U S. P-H-I-L-O-S-T-R-A-T-U-S. Antiquity Unveiled, uh, pages 94 to 100.